How many have taken a course in thermodynamics? How many remember it in all their detail? <laughs> How many have never taken a course in thermodynamics? I mean, because when I started in philosophy of physics, I, I took a, a thermodynamics course as an undergraduate, but, you know, I, I must say that a lot of it didn't stick with me. And I think a lot of people are either in the position of never having taken such a course or having taken it and some of the things are kind of fuzzy. So I'm going to go over some really basic stuff. And it'll be reviewed for some, but hopefully what my presentation will make some of the logical relations things clearer than, than a standard thermodynamics textbook. Did. How many have taken a course in statistical mechanics? How many really thought you knew what was going on? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that's uh, that's one of the things is uh, I mean when I took a course in statistical mechanics, it was presented as if everything was totally conceptually clear, and I sort of felt like you know um, you know other people understood it and um, I didn't. But um, I think the truth is that the foundations of statistical mechanics are a bit murky, and there, and there really isn't any consensus on how these things go. But I'm not going to talk about statistical. I'm going to talk about thermodynamics today. This is all going to be 19th century physics. And if you listen carefully, you'll notice nothing I'm going to say today presupposes the molecular theory of matter. Or not, nothing I'm going to say presupposes that the thermodynamic systems are things that can be treated as mechanical systems with a finite number of degrees of freedom. All of that was in the 19th century an open question. And there were people who had you know, serious physicists who had serious reservations about the possibility of treating thermal phenomena, phenomena mechanically. Um, okay. So, I'm going to talk about the laws of thermodynamics. First question, how many, Newton had three laws of motion. How many laws of thermodynamics are there? As many as you like. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, besides you, yeah, at least two. <laughs> at least two. Yeah. <laughs> usually, people, yeah, usually, pay, you, usually, textbooks say there's three. Um, called rather boringly first law, second law, and third law. More recently, it's become customary to, uh, to acknowledge that there's something that is logically prior to all of those that deserves to be called a law of thermodynamics. And because it's logically prior to, to the others, or we're based or something like that, it ends up being called the zero law. Um, there's a paper by Yost and Harvey Brown in which they identify something that is indeed presupposed, sometimes, or either implicitly or explicitly, in pretty much every thermodynamic textbook. And if you actually start, once they pointed it out. Like you start looking at these things, and yeah, there's an awful lot of thermodynamics textbooks just to start out saying this, uh, um, what they call the minus first law in like you know a um, um, first you know paragraph or something like that. I think, I mean, I think the the first sentence of Pauli's lectures on thermodynamics is pretty much um, what um, Brown and Duffy called the minus first law. So those are the five laws I'm really talking about today. And I say much about the third. The minus first law, um, which they also call the equilibrium principle, is, in their words, an isolated system in an arbitrary initial state within a finite fixed volume will spontaneously attain a unique state of equilibrium. So there's a lot in there. First of all, um, isolated, because if something is not isolated and things are acting on it, you, you, know, you don't expect it to go to a, a stationary state and stay there. Um, the interesting thing is that the idea is arbitrary initial states all go to the same equilibrium state. And you know, it, it does it spontaneously. Um, why within a finite fixed volume? Well, you know, if I have a gas in a box, if there's initially, you know, pressure um, disequilibrium, it'll spread out to fill the box. But you know, if I have a gas and go put it in a container, it'll just keep spreading. And, and, and there's no, um, um, there, there, there's no um, final, final stage in there, there. And I mean, one thing they point out is, if 
This itself is a time asymmetric notion. The idea is that if it's initially in an equilibrium state, it goes to an equilibrium state and stays there, and you know, it doesn't once it's there, it doesn't spontaneously um, um, move for that. And in fact, in that article, um, actually, before I go down, so you know, example of things is, um, and one thing that's very important is if you put two bo bodies into you know, different temperatures into contact with each other, thermal contact, you know, they'll equilibrate and come to a state of uniform temperature all over. I also mentioned if you've got a gas, let's say initially, an example that comes up again and again in um, thermodynamics is free expansion. So if I have a gas in a container, that's initially confined to half the container by a partition, and then I pull the partition out. I've got a gas with um, inequalities of pressure. There's more gas on one side of the box than the other, and what it does is it equilibrates to a um, equilibrium state in which the gas is uniformly spread out and you have uniform pressure all over the place. Um, those are the sorts of examples that come up in the elementary thermodynamics, but don't forget it's not the only kinds of things. And there are, there, there are also chemical disequilibria. So if you, so if you, can, you, know, you can put you know, different chemicals together and um, if there's a thermodynamically favored reaction, then, then they'll do it. They might do it quickly and they might do it slowly. Um, hydrogen and oxygen um, you know, together in a volume. Um, there is a thermodynamically favored state, which you're going to give it a chance to relax, relax to, which is combining to, to form water. But they can sit, uh, until you put a spark there, they can sit there for a long time. Also, um, uh, um, I don't know if you know this, but diamonds are what they call metal, metal stale. Um, the, um, the equilibrium state of carbon, the, 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 the stable state is graphite, but diamonds will last a very long time. Okay, did I mention this? So, I mentioned this is that quickly does not occur in here. And the reason I say that is every once in a while in the philosophical literature, people, you'll find people saying that things like, you know, once something's out, out of equilibrium, it'll quickly go back to equilibrium. Well, relaxation times vary all over the map depending on what kind of system you've got. So, all right, so that's the minus first law. And um, the art, that, that article, um, by the way, you know, whenever I make a reference like that um, in these lectures, um, the full references in the uh, bibliography of the notes I sent you. It's a paper worth reading. Um, what they say is that in thermodynamics, is that law, and not, as usually said, the second law is actually the source of temporal asymmetry. Okay. All right. Okay, the zeroth law. Um, the zeroth law requires a notion of thermal contact. So I'm assuming I know what it means to put objects in thermal contact with each other. Um, like you know, this Pepsi is in thermal contact with the air around it because the container is something that can actually transmit heat. And um, the system, okay, you know, if we were to close off this system and isolate it, um, it would become a system, you know, close off this room and not let air in, and that would become an isolated system and something to which the uh, minus first law. Uh, um, applies, and you know, the minus first law that says that um, left to itself, the system would equilibrate, and among the things happen would would uh, would happen with temperature differences would um, even out. Um, so things in, in um, uh, uh, different temperatures, when you put things into thermal contact with each other, one of three things will happen. You can, you know, we can have heat flowing. Heat from A to B, or from B to A, or nothing. And um, what the um, zero law says 
is that that relation um, indicated by three, the, the relation of two uh, thermal, uh, um, you know, thermodynamic states of things, such, which says that if you put them in thermal contact with each other, they're not going to, uh, there would be no people either way. Um, Pierce also says that's a transitive relation. That if I can put A and B into thermal contact with each other, and, and, and without a heat flow, and I put B and C into thermal contact without a heat flow, then I can put A and C into thermal contact without a heat flow. Which might seem like so obvious it's not worth saying, but it's a non, yep, it's a non-empty assumption. And if, if you look at um, some writers on thermodynamics, they actually um, do bother to explicitly say this, which is something actually that most people take for granted. Maxwell, for example, in this theory, he you know, actually why do I care? Why do I bother pointing out that this is, you know, it, it, it is a transitive relation? Why is it worth saying? Yeah, because then I, I then I've got an equivalence relation. You know, because um, what what are the defining con um, conditions of an equivalence relation? Yeah. So, reflexivity. What's reflexivity mean? When's a relation reflexive? A is. What's that? A has a relation to itself. Yeah, when, some, when everything has that relation to itself. Well, since we're talking about thermal equilibrium states, every, you know, everything is in thermal contact to go up with itself all the time. And you know, if it can be in an equilibrium state, there's no heat flow from itself to itself. Actually, not true. So yeah, so it's a reflexive relation. Um, when B is in thermal contact with A, A is in thermal contact with, you know, if B can be put into thermal contact with A without heat flow, then A can be put into thermal contact with B without heat flow because, you know, when A is in thermal contact with B, B is in thermal contact with C. So it's trivially reflexive and symmetric. So the substantive claim is that this is a transitive relation. And because it's a transitive relation, we've got the equivalence um, relation, and that means we can partition thermodynamic states of things into equivalence relations, which we call equitemperature. So that gives us a way of defining the concept when two thermal, when two thermodynamic states of things, equilibrium states of things count as same temperature states. Um, and we're going to be use that concept later. Notice just having a concept of same temperature isn't the same as being able to compare temperatures. Um, we don't yet have a numerical scale of temperatures just from the zero drop. And in fact, we don't even necessarily have a total ordering. Like we, we haven't yet said what it means to say something is of higher temperature than another. That'll come with the second law. Okay. All right. Okay. First law um, is basically the thermodynamic way of talking about conservation of energy. Um, concept of energy is something that really got developed in the 19th century, and along with it, the idea of conservation of energy. Um, most familiar form of energy is kinetic energy, when you know, something has when it's by virtue of motion, it's one half mv squared. Um, there's also potential energy. If something is in a gravitational field and I move it up, it gains um, potential energy. And the um, reason it's called potential energy is that, you know, that, that can be converted into into kinetic energy if I let the thing go. And if you ignore friction, and we define the potential energy such that um, you know, if you were to ignore friction, the, the, it, it does the things following the, the sum total of kinetic and potential energy would be the, the same. Basically, you can do that any time you have a conservative force. If um, a conservative force is something that um, if I you know, move the thing around the circle, then that interval is going to be um, zero. And 
if I have a conservative force, then I can I, I can dis I, I can um, define a potential energy function, which is um, where the, such that the difference between um, any two states is just the integral of f dot dx over the path. And what we'll say is, well, look, if I'm, you know, lifting this thing up and increasing its potential energy, and actually increasing its total energy, I have to be doing something, and what I'm doing is I'm doing work on it. So um, as I lift this up, thing up, I am doing work on it, and the amount of work I do, I, I, I do is given by that. It's the, you know, um, if the force is constant, it's just the product of, of, of the force that times the distance vertical distance. So I'm lifting that up, I'm doing work on it. If I'm not moving it, I'm not doing any work. That's sometimes counterintuitive because if I kept doing this, yeah, I would eventually get tired. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be getting tired because I was doing any work. So you know, Atlas holding up the world is not doing any work. Um, you might think he is, but he's not. Um, all right. So and in terms of thermodynamics, if you're thinking of a gas, you, know, you work on the gas by compressing it. So, you know, one standard system is going to be a gas in a container with a movable pit piston, and so the um, the work you do, you do work on the gas and compressing it, and you'll be um, increasing its, its its total energy, and then but you can also then you can get that out by letting the gas expand, and then the gas is doing um, work on the external environment. Okay. Um, so the way this is is that you know if I'm doing work on something, I'm increase, increasing its energy. So okay. All right. Um, so that's one way to increase the energy of something. Um, heat flow is another thing. Um, there is presumably um, heat flow happening between my Pepsi and the air. The internal energy of the Pepsi is getting higher as it's getting warmer. Um, used to be one, one theory that was taken seriously for a while was that heat was this fluid that was conserved and just flowed around. Um, but um, the modern view is that that's not true. And the, the experiment that always gets excited in the textbook is Count Rumford drilling um, bores and cannons. In, in, and the idea is there is that like, when you're drilling a bore through a cannon, you know, you're, 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 you're sending a drill down there and it's, you know, it gets really, really hot. So you're getting heat. And you might think what you're doing is that you're squeezing heat out of the brass that was already there and you know, this fluid is coming out of it as, as, as you're pushing on it. But if that's right, you, know, you might think that you know, eventually you run out, the, 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 the bore would run out of heat and Basically, what Robert Rumford did is he just kept going and going and going, and you know, this seemed to be no limit to how much heat you could generate as long as you're you know, cranking on the thing. And also, there's a mechanical equivalent of heat that you can measure. Um, you know, if, if I'm acting on something and doing work on it, you know, it, I can measure the force that's opposing my efforts. I can measure that, and there is a precise relation between. You know, if you say, okay, there's a certain amount of heat that's required to raise, raise water at room temperature one degree, you can measure the amount of heat you're getting. And you can also, if you can measure the force you're exerting on the thing, you, know, you can measure the work you're doing. And there's a, there, there's a mechanical equivalent of heat. There's, there's you know, a, um, a, a relation between um, how much work you have to do and um, the amount of, of heat that, goes, that, that you're generating as measured by, say, you know, color or whatever that measures how it moves temperature of water or something like that. And so what we say these days is we don't think heat is a substance. It makes no sense to talk about the heat content of a body. Um, but what we have is the distinction between doing work in, on a body and heating it is between just two ways of transferring energy between two things. Alright. And um, the first law is basically the um, conservation of energy applied to this. It says that if I do a certain amount of work on a system, then um, the um, internal energy of the system increases by that amount. 
And if I put a sound, if I um, put a certain amount of heat in the system, the internal energy increases that amount. And if I do both, then the increase of internal energy is um, just the sum. And all of those, these quantities can be positive and negative. So I talk about doing work on a system. Um, if the system's pushing on me, it's doing work on that, and we'll just count that as W negative. So you know, if, if it's doing you know, 10 joules of work on me, um, that's equivalent, you know, equivalent to me doing minus 10 joules on it. So, um, so the, the way this is, is, is um, when these things are positive, that counts as an increase of the energy of the system. When they're negative, that's a decrease of the energy of the system. So they're going to be you know, positive or negative. Question so far? That's the first one. All right. Um, it's also sometimes expressed in a differential form. Um, this, um, yeah, it, 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 um, it's very often very convenient to divide a process into um, small um, processes. Um, compounds people say um, in Tesla would actually think that um, what they're doing is talk about fun, small, finite um, changes that are small enough that you can replace some of the integrals. Um, and we'll write it like this. Note there's a north ordinary D on the left-hand side and these Ds with crosses on them on the right-hand side. The reason we do that is that the internal energy of a system is what we call a state function. It's a, if you tell me the thermal state of a, of, of a system, that uniquely specifies its internal energy. But it makes no sense to talk about the heat content of it. So the heat, you know, um, this, this DQ is not a change in a, in a state function. It means I've transferred a certain amount of energy into it, and the way I've transferred it into it is by heat. And this says, you know, I've done a certain amount of work. You know, transferring a number, a certain amount of work to the system in the way of transporting it is, is as work. So uh, we did distinguish between, you know, infinitesimal changes in state functions. Those are, 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 are uncrossed Ds. And um, transfers of energy or changes, something that aren't changed in state fun functions, get um, the, the, the D bar. Um, right. Okay, so the second law. Um, basically is about what you, you know, um, what you can and can't do. Um, uh, um, in terms of you, you know, using energy to do work. Um, the earlier statement, um, I think, I think is, is, is um, Kelvin's this is where it's impossible by means of inanimate material agents to drive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of the coldest amount of What would that mean? Well, one, you know, energy isn't particularly useful. Um, and you might think, okay, if you're thinking about heat engines, then, well, okay, high temperature stuff is useful because if, if I've got a burning, you know, burning coal, I can use it to drive a steam engine or something like that. But if you think of, but really, what's useful is temperature differences when it comes to heat engines. Yeah. Um, it, um, your, um, you know, an essential part of the working of an engine is, uh, of a car engine, for example, is burning gasoline to, to heat the air in, um, in, 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 in that chamber to you know um, make it expand and um, drive the piston, but also an essential part of that is to cool that air back down and, you know, and, and, and um, compress it. And if you've got a bunch of stuff at uniform temperature, it doesn't matter whether it's a high temperature or a low temperature, it's not terribly useful. Um, so um, what this says is you know. Even though I can derive a chemical effect from um, um, extracting heat from something hot, it needs to be something you know cooler around in order to in order to discard part of, part of that uh, um, heat too, in order to actually get the chemical effect. 
Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, and, and maybe this is too early, and you're going to okay. jump in on this later. Um, I, I just want to, I'm, I want to keep track of this issue you raised in the beginning about all of the time directedness yeah. residing in the in the minus first mm -hmm. law. It, it sounds here the way it's stated as if there's time directedness yeah. in it because of right. you know verbs like uh, right. derive right. and right. cooling and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. I raised the issue, and you notice I was I was not committal on it. Yeah, I said, yeah. I, I said Br Brown, Brown and Ufink claim that the that this is the source. I guess in that paper, um, what it said is um, there's a formulation of thermodynamics due to um, Lieben Ingvarsson, is that right? Which in which the second law is um, formulated in a continental I see, way. I see. Right, right, right. Well, yeah. maybe let, 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 let me just speak to that soon. Uh, we did say that there was time directedness in the minus first law. And if I remember correctly, we said, or at least if I present my present opinion, we did say that the time directedness in that law is more fundamental or logically prior than any discussion of the second law. I see, uh, but so it wasn't to deny... I, I did, we didn't say that there is no time directedness in the second law, but we could have said that it might depend on the particular version of the second law, right. at least right. yeah. whether there so, so the idea is that there are proposed versions of the second law that sort of do most of the work that versions like this do, but with the time directedness expunged. Is, that, is that right? Yeah, well, well that's, that's true even even in, in the in the nineteenth century. I mean, most of the most of the discussions that, that Kelvin and Clausius made of the second law uh, was actually only by considering the, the part that's restricted to reversible. I, I mean, I mean here. Uh, I mean, this could apply to reversible uh, process. It certainly has implications. But, for but the right, yeah. yeah. But as um, David pointed out, it has temporally asymmetric notions in. And, you know, cooling something it is to lower its temperature to make it from a, a warmer temperature to a cooler right. temperature. And. Um, so uh, um, you know, you know, the reverse of of, the, of, of this would say, um, you know, if I'm cooling something, you know, the opposite of cooling something in temperature, the inverse of cooling something below the temperature of the coldest form would, would be um, have the thing, you know, start out below the the, um, right. the, the, the um, I see the opposite of this would say it, it's impossible to have something start out. Um, could be a below the temperature of the coldest of the surrounding objects and have it warm up again while doing mechanical effect on it. I think that's not impossible. So I think this is temporally asymmetric and stable. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 I think you, you, you need the whole package. Um, okay. What the second law says in the Kelvin and the Clausius form is you can't go from A to B. Right. You haven't got a time asymmetry yet, unless someone tells you you can go, you can go from B to A, and that's what the minus, what do you call it, minus zero four is going to tell you. It's well, the Clausius form says you can't have a system that starts out in thermal equilibrium and disequilibrates. I thought your minus law is telling you that you can start out with something that's disequilibrated that will equilibrate. So this, you is, go this is not about equilibration. Heat can never pass from a colder body to a warmer body without some other change connecting it. So, well, I take uh, it. Uh, well, I, I mean, well I, sorry. Right. Yes, what were you saying? Well, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm running ahead of, of what you were trying to say. Uh, Kelvin's 
statement, as well as, as Klaus's statement, um, are pretty vague. What people usually read in those statements is that you cannot construct an engine that will work in a cycle, go through a cyclic process, and do the things that we do. Now, of course, he doesn't actually mention the cyclic process, but in all the applications that they are discussing, they are talking. I still think you're making more complicated. You're making more complicated than it need be. The Cartesian okay. form is really telling us you can't go from this to that, and you haven't got the asymmetry until someone says, and you can go back in the other right. direction. You just have an incomplete. Right. But so together, you know, to, you know, so put them together and two, you go. Yeah. yeah. So two plus minus one is <laughs> is one asymmetric law, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if this says you know, you know, when one of the things that's, that's, that, that says is, you know, if you put um, a cooler in a warmer body, you won't, you won't have spontaneous heat from the cold to the warmer, right? That's one of the things that is is, is ruled out by the um, Clausius stage because that would count as heat passing from a colder to warm body without some other change associated with it. And if I add to that that it can go the other way, that is temporally asymmetric. Yeah. It won't, but you won't get the it can go the other way just the minus first or you also need some auxiliary assumptions to the effect that for instance you can right. suddenly change the macroscopic parameters of the system in such ways that it's equilibrated and then you get it. I don't know how useful this is, but if you just state, try to state the reverse of the top one, it is impossible if I'm means of inanimate material agency to derive mechanical effect from any portion of matter by heating it above the temperature of the hottest of the surrounding objects. No, no, but you're no, that's, yeah. the that's, that's the temperature you have to say reverse derived backwards the temporal too. reverse. Okay, <laughs> so go, so. So, it, it, um, the, the temporal reverse of that is um, you can't start with something that's already, that starts out cooler than right. the temperature of the coldness okay. of, of, of Surrounding objects, do and, and do, do mechanical work, 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 work on it, right? And that's false, right? <laughs> right. So the temporal inverse right. of that is false, right? Yeah, right. That's so that's right. So if you add, if you add, to, and I, I think we, a lot of these people, it's, 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 the, 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 the what you can do is taken for granted, mm -hmm. right? Like there's right. lots of stuff that you can right. do that people um, take for granted, and it's not you know worth saying. Right. The important thing is to say what you can't do. So, if you add to that that there are certain things that you can't, that, that the that, that the term, you know, if you say I can't do this, and add explicitly what I think was going unspoken that you can do the temporal yeah. inverse of it, then you have something. The combination of those two propositions yeah. are very good. This is something people are kind of used to. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to say, yeah, this is a slightly different topic. I was just wondering uh, about the. Inanimate material agency cools, which is curious, like about mm, yeah, maybe we actually say this, like well, that's meant to exclude. I was hoping someone would like that. Mm -hmm. um, that is Kelvin's statement. That is left out of the standard textbook statements, <coughs> and the the reason is I think that a lot of people take for granted that the law these days that the laws of physics apply to animate. Kelvin did not take that for granted. Um, vitalism was a live option. And so I think Kelvin was leaving it open that, you know, that um, those of us who have souls have certain, you know, are, are not subject to the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah, laws. but is it that, is it that he, saw, yeah. he saw a clear way for an animate object to, to violate this? Um, he actually might be thinking, um, Actually, good question. Um, it, this is you know uh, um, much earlier than, than, than Maxwell you know talking about Maxwell's demon. Sure. Yeah. No. I assume it's not right. that. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and you need to be more than animate. To right. Do yeah. That. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you also, you have a comment on that? Well, 
Yeah. Well, I, I, he certainly doesn't give you an explicit right. example of how right. eminent uh, right. objects would, would violate this law. But yeah. he, he, wants, he wants to be safe. cautious right. and right. safe. Right. Right. Yeah, I think and, that and that's more. You have to imagine that he's, he's a deeply religious man. Right, right. right. And, I see. and there are many passages, especially in the paper he wrote three years later, right. on, on the heat map, right. where he has phrases right. in his conclusions saying something like, unless acts are performed which are presently considered to be impossible according to the laws of nature. Right. I see. Uh, sort of excluding acts of God right. to right. intervene. Right. Right. Uh, I see. So he, he's always keeping on the safe side. I, I mean, he's not, he's not actually proposing how right. a miracle right. by God right. will save right. us yeah. from the right. death. But he's certainly leaving the option open that, that God yeah. would, right. would do that. Uh, and this comes back with a vengeance in the Maxwell Damon literature. So uh, just reading recently, uh, Smolikowski writing in 1912 explicitly excludes intelligent agents from the analysis that he gives of a, of a Maxwell Damon. Um, you know, because it, there's a very explicit provision there that you know that they might be able to do things with in thermodynamics that that, uh, that ordinary mechanical devices could not, and that yeah. caused a hell of a lot of trouble. Is that before or after Szilard? Oh, that's before. Szilard is responding. Um, you, you know, you know, Szilard's 29 paper has yeah. a long um, has it's a long 21. quote from Smolikowski, but you don't know it's a quote because when they did the translation, they moved the inverted commas. So it's actually a huge chunk of small dusty, and it's just this little, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a real mess. Okay. Uh, Good. Well, just just point to me. All these people writing in, in the mid 19th century didn't state things with any amount of rigor uh, or transparency that yeah. uh, yeah. would now be required. Right. And yeah. Especially in Clausius, the question what he meant. Yeah. What well, do you mean by like some other thing? Yeah. I mean, the intuitive idea is that, I mean, he's not saying I can't break, take heat from a colder body to a warmer body, because, right? um, um, you know, there are refrigerators, right? Um, but, you know, you can, you know, there are heat pumps, you can take you know, heat out of a colder you know, place in a warm place. But that is, you have to do something, right? You have to do some work. You have to dissipate. I mean, the, 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 what he means is, you have to dissipate some, some, some useful potential energy in order to um, expedite move heat from a cold body to a warm body. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Yost um, is absolutely correct. This um, other change connected there with occurring at the same time is a bit vague. Um, there's a very nice paper by Yost on this called Block Your Way in the Second Law, where he discusses Question? Yeah. Um, this may be, um, I'm sure I've asked this question too, but there's no, if heat is not a um, state function, it makes no sense to talk about the heat content of the body. What exactly do we mean by heat passing from the colder body to the warmer one? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's assumed that um, we know the different. We, I'm implicit in um, the closest thing is, is we know when we're transferring energy via heat flow. Right? And um, the um, so, for example, you know, can I can I um, take heat from a a a, a, a cooler body, you know? Um, maybe um, passing it, you know, into some intermediate sub thing. Then you know, do something, you know, um, maybe you know, warm that up, up in, a, in, in, in a reversible way, and then they take it to the hotter body and have heat flow into that, and have and, and then return my intermediary device to its initial state. Could I do? Could I have a heat engine that did that? In that case, the um, you know, it, it's sort of on the view that the both of that the you know, heat coming out of the cooler one going into it counted as heat flow. Right. So basically, <coughs> essentially, he's saying that that can't be done. If you really want to find the heat lab, I suppose you could say something like one of the 
there are heat type energy transfers, there are work type energy transfers, right. and there are hybrid energy transfers, we know which is which. Yeah. There can't be a pure heat type energy transfer problem. Yeah. 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 The, the way yeah. I've seen that handled, and it's a tricky question, yeah. is you say, I know what the internal energy change is, because energy is well defined. I know what the work change is, mm -hmm. because you've got you know, the various parameters. Mm -hmm. Whatever's left is heat. Mm -hmm. And then it, it works out very nicely, because there's yeah. always, there's always a, a, a temperature difference. But that's that's the way that tends to be worked because, because it is the other way. So that it, first it, story, yeah. Sorry, that yeah. first story, you can't even talk about heat then. Heat um, you yeah, you can always talk about heat. Um, <laughs> but so you have to talk about heat in the sense that you're talking about you know how much of the energy exchange counts as heat exchange, how much kind of works. So what John is saying is, if I have two systems and I know that the internal energy of this system went down by a certain amount and the internal energy of this system went up by a certain amount. And I also know which how much of that transaction I'm going to count as work because I've identified certain you know changing per certain the values of certain parameters as work. Then everything else is heat. I mean, and, and, and it actually but so for we think of the gas. Uh, the easiest e easy thing is think of, think of a gas in the in the chamber of the piston, and then we say. Changing the volume of that gas counts as work and nothing else does. Now if I say that, you know, that you know, if I add energy to it by pressing on the pit, 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 piston, that counts as doing work. If I extract it, energy from it by um, letting it expand, that counts as work. And so, so then I know how much work is done on or by the system. Then I say, and every and any other change of internal energy counts as heat transfer. Yours doesn't like that. No. Uh, <laughs> it's not. Uh, well, we get we're making things more and more complicated. And it's it's not true uh, that the only change of energy that is done by changing the volume. Of the system counts as work. I would say, it, 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 you so can, if I have a gas, oh, even yeah. if you have a uniform gas, gas. You, you can have a gas okay. and have a stirring device. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and yeah. uh, do work on that stirring device. This is Jules' experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, without changing its volume yeah. uh, and changing its energy. And this still counts as work. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a model that, in a so way, it looks like the, the first law still. Yeah. So you're going to have a big double turn there. Yeah, yeah it, you're right. In, in yeah. relation to the other question, uh, earlier suggestion by John, uh, you have just defined energy in terms of the mechanical equivalent of heat. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's not true that in this, in this approach, is that that we already know what energy is and it's well defined uh, before we talked about heat. Well, this, this question was because it's not a state function. So if you start yeah. out with a repertoire of well defined quantities, we'll assume we have the state functions. But you how, do you, how do you get but you, you, and you, you get, how do you, you do it? You get on, but you only get, in this particular approach, you only get the state functions after you talked about the mechanical equivalence of heat. Uh, and and what, what my proposal would be is that I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, historically, if, if you we talk about Clausius, only, only three years before Clausius made his statement, he still believed that heat was a substance and, and therefore preserved, and that the heat content of the body made sense. Uh, so it, it hasn't been always been as obvious to people. I mean, the, the, the contrary was more obvious. Uh, that it makes no sense to talk about the heat content. Uh, it took people very long, hard work and thought to come up with the idea that this was problematic. Uh, and now, of course, although we don't want to talk any longer about the heat content of the body because it gets to us into problem, uh, the phenomena of heat particular heat flow uh, are still empirically well defined. I mean, in, in the sense that we know empirically when the heat flow happens. Uh, and 
in my way, I mean, you, you should simply just have to regard heat as a mode, as, as David Wallace was saying, as a mode of transfer. Mm -hmm. So it's not a particular type of energy, it, it's a particular type right. of energy exchange. Right. Uh, and that's what Clausius, at least, is talking about. Uh, when he talks about he, he passing from one body to another. It's not that you take out a certain amount of substance and put it into another body, but there is still a form of transfer. Okay. Of, of, so some people say that it's not heat that is fundamental, but heating or cooling. I, I think that that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's unfortunate that we have this now. Yeah, so it's just it's, yeah, So, you know, everyone begs should bear that in mind that Distinction, you know, in, in that D equals D, you know, DQ plus DW, those are distinction. That's a partitioning of the total change of energy into a change of energy that we regard as heating or cooling, and a change of energy we regard as doing work. And the nice thing is, doing work is a verb. And unfortunately, heat flow has this noun heat that sounds like there's something that's flowing. What, but what's really important for the second law, you do need to state the second law of thermodynamics. You need to, do need a distinction between those two modes of energy transfer, between um, do, you know, heat transfer, or heating and cooling, and working. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be interested to hear more about um, what what this distinction is. Uh, so so I know from reading your work on on Maxwell. That uh, that he thought that there was this distinction between um, heat and heat and work. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this transfer of energy. Uh, work is kind of uh, well, the transference of kinetic energy that I can kind of direct it. I can direct a will, but heat is kind of well. I can't. I can't kind of direct this. It's it's kind of a bit all over the shop. And so I take it that. Uh, he thought that there's this kind of means relative distinction um, as to uh, be between heat, heat uh, energy transfer and work energy transfer. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, whether this is the right way of thinking about uh, the distinction between heat and work, or whether uh, I should be thinking about this in a different way. That I will defer to the, the other day, because I'm going to be talking more about that in, um, on, what's the other day I'm talking Thursday? Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I would think it makes a lot of difference whether you are considering the context of statistical mechanics or kinetic theory okay. on the one hand, and thermodynamics on the other hand. Okay. Yeah, when, when Maxwell is talking, he's, he's considering the the kinetic theory of gas, where uh, the distinction between heat and work becomes much more problematic. In the thermodynamics case, uh, which is uh, admittedly a, a purely phenomenological or macroscopic law, which doesn't talk about the constitution of, of matter and therefore whether heat is sort of dissipated uh, and unorganized motion of, of the, the particles. Uh, you just have to assume that heat and work are two different ways in which the system can be influenced. That's just a fundamental assumption of that particular theory. Uh, what that distinction actually is, is harder to say. But it's a basic assumption of the theory that you can make I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. In the third down of context, it was compared to take your grant. We know when we're doing work on something. We know when we're heating it. Um, and Maxwell's reflections were more basic. We you know, what is that distinction amount to at the molecular level? And then it becomes less clear. I'll be talking about that. Because I actually promised that um, nothing I was going to say today would, would presuppose um, molecular theory so it would yeah, so anyways, it's basically assumed that you know, you know the difference. 
And you can't even state the second law unless you know the difference between doing work on something and, 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 and eating it. And you know, in practice, we do seem to know the difference. And when I'm compressing the gas, I'm doing work on it. Or you know, when I'm paddling it, you know, with the paddle, I'm doing, I'm doing work on it. If I want to heat it, I have to put the thermal contact to something at a different temperature. Questions about that? Um, the third thing is stuff that it's, it, it, it's customary to distinguish between two kinds of processes. One is, I, I use QSI to, to, to abbreviate it, um, the um, that stands for quasi static reversible processes. The idea is, first of all, quasi static means it's happening so slowly that it, it might as well be an equilibrium. So um, you know, if I'm compressing a gas, if I do it, you know, if, if, I, if, if I whack the piston, there's going to be this, you know, shock waves to go that goes through the thing, and there's going to be pressure, you know, pre pressure inequalities within the, with the gas. But if I press it slowly, well, I, you know, I am creating little pressure inequalities, but you know, if, if I do it slowly enough, those are going to um, wash out and on time scales much faster than the change of, of volume so I can treat it as if it's in equilibrium all the time. So you know what quasi, quasi um, static means. Um, sometimes people say it's an idealization in which um, that things go infinitely slowly but I think you know, John uses that as one of the examples where you know, the, ideal, the, the limit idealization does not exist because there's no such thing as a process that goes infinitely slowly and gets finished. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and so I think that the the um, the approximation is it's going slowly enough that you can in you know treat it in effect as if it's an equilibrium at, 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 at all times. And reversible means I'm not. It essentially means that um, you know I can do it. I, I can do something and essentially restore this the state. It doesn't necessarily mean that the temporal inverse of the thing is 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 possible, but, but you know that's often. And so you know if I can compress a gas or, or actually you know expand a gas and somehow store the energy that I'm getting out of it, like in a spring or a battery or something like that, and then undo it, not necessarily by exact temporal inverse and stuff, so that the you know, both the gas and my auxiliary system gets re restored to its initial state without making some, without any other change associated therewith. It's a rever reversible process. And basically, reversible processes are supposed to be distinguished between people and distinguished from um, dissipative processes. Dissipative processes, you know, the, the things that dissipate energy. So putting a cold and hot thing in, um, Thermal contact with each other and letting them equilibrate. Equilibrate. That's a dissipative process. Um, um, I can't restore. There's no way I'm going to restore that system to its initial state without expending some um, use. So, you know, the energy. There's no. There's you know the close closest formulation is saying once that happened, I can't put it back to that cold and warm. State. State via some device that is going to, at the end of the process, be restored to the device's initial state. Okay. All right. Now, coming up to Carnot's theorem, then, so we have a snack. So we'll do that. Okay. Um, heat engines. Um, Basically, heat engines. I'm, you know, I'm using these um, this unfortunate phrase extracts an amount of heat. Um, it would be nicer if you know, affects heat transfer of amount. Because <laughs> right, right, right. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to suggest that there's you know, heat, heat, there, you know, heat is a subject. So affects heat transfer Q in. So you know Q heat transferred into the system from a hot reservoir, um, does some work on its, on, on, its on, on its surroundings, and then affects 
heat transfer, you know, a certain amount of Q out in, into a colder reservoir. Um, we can. I mean, one of the things, one of the things that motivated the, the science of thermodynamics was analysis of, of heat engines. Though um, it's not clear that the science of thermodynamics actually really helped anyone design heat engines. But, um, so the efficiency of this is um, um, okay. Well, conservation of energy says that. Um, oh, and I should have. Um, Said works in a cycle, so so everything it, it gets restored to its initial initial state. So um, if, if that if that's true, then conservation of energy says that the work done is just uh, is just Q in minus Q out because the if if the heat engine operates in a cycle and gets restored to its initial state, then the net internal energy of the system is zero. So Increase of internal energy by about Q in. Um, decrease of internal energy W, then further decrease um, Q out. Um, so if I want to, and, and, you know, this is what I really want. You know, I want to have lots of this, you know, per um, unit of that. So we define the energy as you know how much work you get for for a certain amount of heat in. And um, because W is Q in minus Q out, that's equal to that. Um, then this, this is Carlos game. If you assume the second law is an axiom, and I think um, you know, the, the, the fundamental possible was the word that they, they, they got used, I believe. Um, if I have any two engines that operate sorry, in a cycle in a quasi-static reversible manner, between two reservoirs they have the same efficiency, and that depends on the temperature of the two reservoirs. And moreover, any other heat engine, the you know, one that doesn't work in a QS manner, has a lower efficiency. And the argument for that is, if I have a reversible engine, I can run it in reverse. And I can use it to, you know, basically um, go backwards. You know, extract a, 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 you know, I do a certain amount. Uh, I, I, uh, I do a certain, a certain amount of, of, of work on it, and whose net effect is to extract a, a certain amount um, from, from this reservoir and put it in, and um, and um, transfer. Of that amount to the hot reservoir, and if I had a more efficient engine than my my um, reversible engine, I could use, I you know, I could I could use that to extract it, you know, extract a certain amount from the hot end, you know, from the hot reservoir. Use the work I get from my more efficient engine to run my reversible engine backwards, and um, have a net of have both engines work in a cycle and have a net effect of. Um, 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 more um, yeah, of, of transferring heat from 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 the cold reservoir to to the hot reservoir, and there, you know, transferring heat means you know, heat transfer from the cold reservoir into in you know into um, uh, it, into the system consisting of the two engines and heat transfer the other thing. So and and, and restoration of both engines to their, their initial state. Um, I'm going to get to entropy and then we'll take a All right. And this lets us actually um, define a temperature scale. Because um, you know, even though I've been saying hot and cold, um, we, um, nothing I've said so far has presupposed any kind of numerical um, temperature scale. Is that what you can do is Given, since that the um, efficiency of a reversible engine operating between two heat reservoirs is a function only of the temperature of those things, then I can um, define a um, 
a numerical temperature by this. The ratio of the temperatures is just 1 minus that uh, heat efficiency. Um, that defines the temperature up to, um, you know, a numerical scale up to an arbitrary scale factor. And if I choose, the, you know, a degree to be the size of a centigrade degree, then that temperature scale is the absolute or Kelvin scale. That's, a, that, that's actually a very good point, because you want um, TC over TA to be TC over TB times TB over TA. Yeah. Yes. It's going to because you can, you can yes. break it. You, 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 you want one way to run a versatile engine to change it. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so we can get out oh, the thermodynamic temperature scale from Corner's theorem, which depends on the second law. Right. Um, the second, so, but when you talk about the minus first law, you're quite keen to emphasize that it just gives you a partition of the temperatures, right. yeah. uh, but not any ordering on them. So right. it's not the second law required. I mean, so, oh, is, sorry, is there, is there some way of like defining an ordering of temperatures independently, or should we regard the second law as a way of defining an ordering on the, on the possible temperatures? I would say that. Um, it, it, it's only when we got the second law that I actually, actually stated something that entails that there is a total order of temperatures. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, everything else that I've um, said um, would be prior to that was could be consistent with um, um, you know there actually not being a, a total ordering. Um, you might you, know, you might say okay um, I'm going to define because it's assumed that we know the direction of, of, of heat flow. And you might say, I'm going to define a total ordering by, you know, A is higher than B if when you put them in thermal contact, heat goes from A to B. But um, you want, you know, hotter than to be transitive. And actually, we not, nothing we've said pri prior to the second law entails that it, that, that it is. You know, you could, up to, up to the moment we, we say the second law, you could imagine you put two bodies together, you know, A and B together, and heat flows from A to B. You put, you know, B and C together, heat flows from B to C, B to C but then you put um, C and A together, and heat flows from C to A. Right. And if that were true, um, then um, I'm pretty sure you could, you, know, you, you could, you could, um, you got three you know, heat reservoirs with that, you could, you could construct a heat engine that um, violates the second law. Is shut off yeah. With that, yeah, 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 right. With, with that cyclic thing, right, be ruled out by your, your minus first law. I don't think or, so. Or does that count as an equilibrium stage? Uh, no, yeah. I don't think it's run out. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's ruled out by the minus first law. I've got the expert here, so I'm asking. Uh, I, I didn't quite get the question. Um, what would it, what would happen if if is hotter than is, a, is an intransitive relation. So you can have a cycle A, B, C such that heat just passes from A to B, from B to C, from C to A, and just keeps going round and round. What would happen if I put A, B, and C all, all in contact with each other? Yeah, and you make a little, you know, you make a little circle, so you just got the heat moving, it just keeps moving around. Um, now, it, 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 it a lot depends on what you mean by equilibrium, whether that it gets ruled out or not. Um, well, the, I mean, it's cert I mean, let, let me say that uh, it's certainly possible to come up with uh, thought examples that will violate this minus first law. Uh, I didn't, we certainly didn't intend that to be something which is analytically true. Uh, rather, we only intended to promote it to a law of thermodynamics mm -hmm. in order to point out that it is an empirical 
substantive assumption about the systems you're talking about, that's not a priori self-evident. Yeah, what, what I claim is nothing I've stated prior to the second law um, ruled out these intransitive you know, you know, temporization of hotter than. And I mean, what the minus first law would say that if I did that, it would reach, reach some kind of equilibrium. It's not like when, when, you know, when things equilibrate, the temperature changes, right? So you know, if, uh, um, if I have you know this cyclic T A B and C, the minus first law would say I put them all together, and something happens to the temperatures of all those until they're in, in, until they're all the same temperature. Well, yeah, but I think that jumps. That's not the same case. If you think an equilibrium situation is a set steady state situation where heat is flowing, the loop. Yeah, I, I, I'd say this example would certainly violate the minus first law, uh, or uh, there's, there's the, the other uh, more or less self-evident assumption you use that uh, thermal equilibration is about that particular system in which this particular case in which the two systems do not have uh, heat exchange? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I took the minus first law, say that it, you know, if I put two things in disequilibrium, like, like one way to do that. No, I'm sorry, I, mean, I meant the zero law. The, the zero law. The zero law is about the equilibration right. of right. two different systems that are put into thermal contact. Right, yeah. Now, if, if you're right and, and uh, hotter than is not a transitive relation, then I could put A into contact with B, they would not be in equilibrium, they would ec equilibrate according to the uh, zero law. Uh, well, but then I could put the other two into the equilibrium. Zero law only talks about what happens when you have equilibrium. I don't remember what the wording was, but... Sorry, yeah. Minus first law tells you, tells you they're going to equilibrate. Uh, yeah, you're right. Well, anyway, if, if you have three systems that you could put, depending on how you put them into contact, you could always obtain some new evolution of the total system and do that cycle, then I don't think that minus first law would hold that. Because that would count as a sort of odd equilibrium system. Right. Yeah. Just check what goes wrong if you suppose that you had three systems that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that when you put into thermal contact, heat does flow in a cycle, but it only does so for a little while, and then after a while, it like that dies down. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that, that's 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 that, I mean, the minus first law would basically say that that's what would happen if you, if you put these things in. Right, so we're just trying, would that be consistent with like minus first and zero? And Versatiles, I guess. Yeah. And, okay, so that kind of thing yeah. only gets ruled out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is it obvious that same temperature is still reflexive if you've got this loop with object A plus the heat to itself? Or why um, B and C? Well, I, I think minus first law says that it doesn't keep going around, it equilibrates and, you, and everything becomes the same temperature. Like, you don't have this thing, you know, just keep going around and around. Right. Take a break for coffee, please. Right, no, after Pablo had a question. It was just, I kind of lost the traction of this I just want to know, uh, so how can I see that temperature was defined that way is such a quantitative, which is what you want from that uh, here as well? Um, if, um, so if, um, Tb over Ta is greater is greater than one, and Tc over Tb is greater than than one. Then Tc over Ta is greater than one. Um, I think that what you know what David said is is, is, is right because you, you know if you you, you, know, if you, you could put a um, key key that key key engine in between in, in between them. Uh, what is that? Uh, 
the engine. So, 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 I mean, one way to run a, 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 a heat engine between A and C is to is is to have a intermediate reservoir in between them and and, and, and use that as an auxiliary, auxiliary as as my, my heat engine, in, you know, from A to C. I mean, yeah. try, try this. I've got bodies A, B, C in my heat engine work with energy. You know, heat Q comes out of body A. Heat one minus e to a b q goes into body b, um, and then I then, then I then heat one my one minus uh, e to a b heat, um, q heat comes out of body b again. One minus e to a b times one minus e to b c q goes into body c. So that two-step heat engine is a reversible heat engine running between body a and body c, and so its efficiency must be one minus e to a b one minus e to a c e to c. So that tells us that one minus e to a c equals one minus e to a b one minus e to b c. Okay, right. then violating the second law. Right. So you need to put this intermediate uh, body and the, running. That's exactly how Calvin does. Okay. Um, and the switch topics briefly and talk about. Um, a particularly simple thermodynamic system, which unfortunately doesn't exist, um, is an ideal gas. Um, an ideal gas is defined to be a, a gas that satisfies two things. One is um, Joule's law, which says the internal energy is a function only of the temperature. Um, so there's no um, two states of the gas that have the same temperature and different internal energy. And also, um, Boyle's law that you, if I compare two states of the gas um, at the same temperature, that, but, but possibly at different volumes, then the pressure is going to be inversely proportional to the volume. Or another way of saying that is that P times V is always the same at the same temperature. And that means I can use that to define a temperature scale, basically by ideal gas thermometry. You know, I could, you know, I could use an ideal gas as a thermometer and, um, you know, let's say, keep the thing at fixed pressure, and then if I measure its volume, then I, then I, um, you know, um, I, I can find the temperature, which is basically what a thermometer is. You know, with, um, um, you know, you've got some sample of something that expands with, um, when it gets warmer, and you know, the, and the volume, increasing volume, um, tells you what increase temperature. Okay, so that means that you, you, know, you can write this down. You know, write down something more. From, this is probably what you're familiar with as the ideal gas law. Um, is that you know ba basically um, you know by definition the um, Temperature is proportional to pressure times volume, and then you you can compare um, different samples of gas. You know, you might pick a um, a um, standard um, quantity, um, which is actually used to um, you know you, you, you can say you know, a, a, a certain you know, say a liter of gas at standard uh, um, temperature and pressure, and then um, you know, and, and so different samples of gas will, will have a quantity of gas which is you know, a certain proportion of our standard um, amount. And then you know, they, they just, you know, there's this constant which um, basically uh, um, fixes the uh, comparison of, um, of units. So that's usually what's um, um, regarded as the ideal gas law. Yes? Sorry, is there a constant for uh, all ideal gases or? All particular ideal gases. Um, all ideal gases. All right. And so now we've got two temperature scales. You know, we've got our absolute temperature um, def defined in terms of the efficiency of a reversible engine operating in two reservoirs, and we've got an ideal gas temperature, which is. Um, you know, defined in terms of um, you know, the uh, value of P times V for an example of ideal gas. And the question is, is there any relation between the two? And we actually have, um, you know, there's, there's enough in what's said, before, said so far 
to actually um, discover what the relation between the two is. Because one of the things I can do, if I have two heat reservoirs, is I could use an ideal gas as the working medium of a heat engine. And um, to you know, operate it in a reversible way. And I can get the efficiency of that heat engine in terms of the ideal gas temperatures. And I know the efficiency of um, any reversible engine operating between those reservoirs in terms of absolute temperatures and just set those efficiencies equal to each other. The strategy is, I imagine an ideal gas heat engine, a, a heat engine whose um, a engine whose working substance is an ideal gas and um, you know, I um, can use my ideal gas temperature to tell me, you know, you know, I'll know how my, my a given sample of an ideal gas will have a certain volume when you the interval equal rear rear with that so I can measure the ideal gas temperatures of those. And so we call those theta H and theta C. And I can pick a reversible cycle that's particularly easy to analyze, and that's known as the Kano cycle. And by doing an analysis of the cycle, I can get the efficiency of the engine as a function of the ideal gas temperatures of those two reservoirs. And then I can just say the efficiency of, the, of, of that engine is um, that one minus um, the absolute, the ratio of absolute temperatures. Everyone understand the strategy? Um, and basically, the Carnot cycle um, you know, isn't a particularly good way to design an engine, but you, so you, but you want it to be um, a reversible engine, so you don't want there to be a heat transfer from bodies of um, diff of, uh, of different temperatures. So either you start the engine at the temp at the, with the gas at the temp uh, um, at the temperature of the hot engine, and um, then you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, blinking, blinking, and I can cut over. Yeah. So, so, you, so you you extract a certain amount of, of, of heat by expanding, uh, by by uh, um, expanding it, and and um, it does a certain amount of work on the environment as you, as as it expands then you want to cool it down to the temperature of the cold reservoir, so you expand it further and it, and it does um, work while um, cooling down. Adiabatically. Ad 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 adiabatically, yeah. So you, you, yeah, you, so yeah, you take it away from the reservoir, you, you, you adiabatically isolate it, which means that you don't let any heat in and out of it. You expand it uh, adiabatically in isolation from the two reservoirs until it's at the temperature of the cold reservoir put it in contact with the cold reservoir, compress it, and um, you, know, you, have to, you have to do work on that, dump a certain amount of heat, heat out, and then adiabatic, uh, adiabatically compress it until it's at the temperature of the, of the, of the uh, hot reservoir. Um, and then there's a certain net amount of work, you, you know, as it's expanding, it's doing work on the environment, as you're compressing it, you're doing um, um, work on it, and I'm not going to give the detailed analysis here. It's in the notes, um, but the punchline of that is that um, the efficiency um, is actually re um, related in a very simple way to the ideal gas temperatures because the um, Basically, the ratio Q in to Q out is, is the same as the ratio of the, of, of the temperature uh, um, of the hot reservoir to the, um, to the cold reservoir. Another way of saying that is Q in divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir is equal to Q out divided by the temperature of the cold reservoir. Which just gives us the efficiency is that. 
and the efficiency in terms of the ideal gap, I'm uh, sorry, the absolute the thermodynamic temperature is that. And that tells us They're equal up to proportionality. Yeah, they're equal up to a proportionality constant. When one of them is, you know, it's, 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 they're proportional to each other. And the easiest thing to do is just choose the proportionality constant to be one, and just um, you know define a scale for our ideal gas temperature and our um, our, our, our um, thermodynamic temperature, so that we can actually just use the same number for both temperatures, which is what we did. Thank you. Um, yeah, some of you will probably have request when I introduce two temperatures. Um, it turns out that the two temperatures are in fact the same. By the way, um, that's, I mean, this is true for an ideal gas. And one thing I, I did mention is that real gases don't satisfy either of those clauses of, of the ideal gas law. But as long as they're not too dense, then they come close. So the um, internal energy is a prop for a gas that's not too dense is approximately equal. Um, a function of the temperature only and not of the pressure. And um, Boyle's law is approximately um, true as long as the density isn't too high. And um, when you, but when you, approximately but not exactly, and um, real gases actually satisfy much more complicated um, equations of state than the um, ideal gas law. Um, but anyways, but um, but in, in, in terms of actual thermometry, you know, you know how much things expand um, with, 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 with temperature. I mean, you could think about you know, when people were starting to do um, thermometers, you, know, you, you, you know, put a substance in the tube, and you might pick a, you know, here's a reference temperature, um, say, you know, temper, you know, freezing temperature of water at, at, at um, one, one atmosphere. Here's another reference to temperature, say boiling point of water at one atmosphere, and then you know, okay, let's you know, let's mark off these and even divisions between those on the two. Well, even divisions for one working substance aren't necessarily even divisions for another one. Yeah, they're not. They're not. The volumes aren't going to be proportional to each other. And so what happened is people had various temperature scales with very complicated relations in between them, and you know, you would you know have these like tables of conversion or something like that. And um, Maxwell in the theory of heat mentions you know, that there was some temperature scale used in Italy for a while. Um, and we have these records of like temperatures in terms of that scale, but we don't have any of those thermometers. So the, um, the relation between those temperatures and you know, temperatures of known thermometers was, 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 un was unknown. All right. OK. All right. <coughs> Okay, so here's why I, one reason I, was, I wanted to talk about the Carnot cycle. Um, so what this means is um, if I go around the cycle, you know, start with a, a certain state and go through a, a, a sequence of changes, um, um, I can break up the heat that's um, tra heat transfer into little bits that I can treat as, in, uh, as small enough that I can um, in, in, in integrate them over, over them. And this, for the simple, actually, th this one is particularly simple because all, the, all, all of Q in happens at the same temperature and all of Q out happens at the same temperature, but you can you know, imagine more complicated processes where the temperature is always changing and um, I would have to consi consider it made up, made up of lots and lots of little um, processes um, where the temperature is effectively constant over it. Over. So, um, and here your know, Q in is going into the system, Q out is the amount of heat that gets dumped into the cold reservoir, so that, it, so that counts as a negative change to the, uh, to the uh, you know, DQ negative as far as the system's concerned. concerned. So this is, you know, all the heat goes in at the high temperature, and then there's 
heat out at the low temperature, and because that's equal to that, um, the, 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 net, the net dq over t around the cycle is zero. And what the textbooks all say at this point is, moreover, this has to be true for any quasi, actually, any um, reversible cycle. And the idea is that if I, you know, if I have some quasi QSR process that goes through the um, state space of the system, um, then what I can do is I can divide that up and approximate that path as closely as, as I want to by um, segments. So the Carnot cycle has segments which are al al alternately um, equitemperature and a, a diabatic. And so I, you know, I um, and approximate that path by segments that, that, you know, that are alternately equitemperature and a diabatic and get as close as I want to, um, to the actual path. And for for um, for that cycle that that alternates between equitemperature and the diabetic things, you know, those are going to be that's going to be lots of equivalent to lots of sort of, of Carnot cycles. And um, if that's true with the Carnot cycles, then that then and I can approximate it as my actual cycle as closely as I want to by lots of, of, of uh, Carnot cycles, then that'll be true for my Why do I care? Well, the reason I care is, that, and this is, you know, we've seen a, a move like this similarly. Um, when we're talking about potential energy, you know, if there's a certain function such that the integral around any cycle is, um, is zero, then I can um, define a state function such that the difference between the value of that function is two states is just that integral of that Thing between the two states. Or I can define a, a, a state function such, you know, since this is zero around any reversible cycle, I can define a state function such that the difference between its value in state B and its value in state A is just, th this will be the same, uh, this will be the same for any reversible path connecting A and B. The reason it'll be saying for any reversible path connecting A and B is um, um, if I go from A to B and then B to A, that's a that, uh, uh, actually I'm, I'm sorry. If I, you know, if I go to, from A to B by two paths, um, then I can perform with a cycle that goes from A to B along one path and then from B to A backwards along the other path, and since the um, value around that cycle has got the, the integral around that cycle has got to be zero, then you know the integral along this path from A to B, you know, it, um, it, uh, has to be the same as the integral from that path from the B to, from from A to B because this minus that is zero. That make sense? You know, guys weren't following like on my head. Like, I could, I could draw that. <laughs> I think. It's... Can I just check? What's that? Yeah. Uh, just the. So, so just this first step where you say uh, must be true for any QSR cycle because uh, we can always do an adiabatic or isothermal step, and okay. that's true on any such path. Okay. So. Um, it won't presumably be true all. An individual, like of an individual isothermal segment, that uh, the dq over t along that segment will be zero with it, or have I? Yeah. So I. If I do a, a PV to P diagram, um, the yeah, isotherms are going to look like this, and then. Uh, by it, so I'm going to be that. So the yeah, Car Carnot cycle would be like that. And the idea is if I have any arbitrary cycle like this, 
I can say, I can alternate, you know, here's the diabat isothermal, diabat isothermal, like that as closely as I want, and then um, connect them. Um, oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and, and, and then, yeah. Um, I guess what I want to do is you know, collect some, connect some down here with, with, with some down here so that I, have, I, I actually have a whole bunch of small um, um, kernel cycles. Okay. Yeah. That sounds normally really wrong, but just what do you need to do it. I don't think you need to do it that way. Yeah. What, what matters, first it looks a little hokey because you're approximating a smooth curve by a sawtooth, yeah. and that looks like you know that, that's a, a recipe for paradox normally. But in this case, it's okay because what you care about is the area under the curve, right? And that area is not going to be affected by the fact that you've got a wiggly, uh, mm -hmm. wiggly sawtooth. Right. And what you do is you figure out the the, the area enclosed right. by the curve is, is, if I remember correctly, it goes back a few years, right? It's going to be the work, um, and um, uh, let me think. That's right. It's the work, and then you go. Then what's the next step? Once you know the work, once you know the area. You know yes. the area that, that that's that's, that's in, the work. In, 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 in the in the heat diagram. That's the right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and then that and that's the, of course it's the heat because you go back to the same spot. Yeah. So that, so yeah. 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 But um, if I can add a little remark yeah. here, uh, the argument is not as strong as it may seem that you actually derive the existence of the state function. Uh, from, you do derive it from once you concluded that it must be true for any quasi-static right. reversible cycle. Right. Uh, but there's an analysis by Frank Array uh, in his work on thermodynamics in which he points out that actually, uh, assuming what you just said, mm -hmm. uh, namely that if you have any such cycle, you can always break it up into small Carnot cycles. That already does, of course, uh, much of the work for the writing purposes. Because what you're assuming here is actually that the curves, the, the isothermic curves, okay. for well, you we already assumed that those form a foliation. Mm -hmm. And the adiabats also have to form a foliation. Uh, and in fact, the two of them by themselves would form uh, coordinate mm -hmm. of uh, the state space. Uh, that means that there is a function that should be constant along the Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's, and that's that's going to be the entropy. Right. But the assumption that you can always do this, that you can. Uh, Approximate an arbitrary cycle, mm -hmm. means of Carnot process, mm -hmm. is a very substantive assumption, uh, which by itself already implies. Isn't that the sort of thing that the axiom systems use as one of the big axioms? Didn't Carafoto Theodori have something? No. It was something well, it's, it's all about accessibility, isn't it? About the axioms? That's about accessibility, but the, that's. I don't know whether Frank Array's observation have actually been, been worked into an axiomatic system, but it, it, it's a very deep, I mean, it's not trivial that the adiabats would, first of all, never intersect, uh, and that they would fill the entire, that you can fill the entire plane by adiabats, so that they form a foliation. Uh, but that's, that's the basic assumption that goes into it. I know it's just a bit of jargon for people who aren't familiar with this. Um, we say something's an adiabatic process if there's no heat in and out of the system during that process. And an adiabat on this, uh, in the state space is a, you know, a collection of, of, of states that can be connected by an, an adiabatic process. Um, yeah, the isotherms foliating the um, state space is just saying that everything has a temperature and nothing has two, two temperatures. That's easy, but that the um, adiabats will don't intersect. Because obviously, 
they, 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 they don't intersect and they fill the, the state space. Right, that is a that is that is, that, that is a non-trivial function or assumption, yeah. and it's it's essential because what what you end up essentially saying is that you know, there there's a state function that's constant on big events. Right? Yeah. The left hand end, I think, of the state Um, you're right. Yeah. So, are you still talking about an ideal gas here, or have we moved from ideal gases to just any any system? Um. We have, um, I am talking about an ideal gas here, and okay. So for an ideal gas, you can you you you, you can um, actually show that the that the, the ideal gas. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's where I was going. It's one of the properties, but I, I take it this is intended to be right. In general. Right. And um, If I have a system now, doesn't it follow that then if you know I, if for if I have another system, then not an ideal gas, and I can run a high a, 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 a heat engine between those two reservoirs using that other system as 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 a operating system, it has to have the same efficiency, like Carnot's theorem, and hence that has to be true for it too. I mean, I, I can write a kind of cycle for, um, with a, you know, another another system. For, um, well, I was just trying to get to, yeah. to Yoss's point about the right. um, about the right. adiabats about foliating. Right. Yeah. The, the, the space. Can you get it from that? I mean, you might. Yeah. Be, yeah. It's, so I think it's a, it's a non-trivial assumption, but yeah, if I if I can do that argument that you know this is true, it, it's true for an ideal gas, and um, I can use those same heat reservoirs using any other system as, as my working substance, then doesn't it follow that it has to be true for that other thing too? If the cycle's possible. If the cycle's that, possible. But, but that means you have to have right. this um, this adiabatic expansion right. phase right. that will take you from one temperature to another, and maybe right. we're just dealing with some perverse substance where you can't do that. Right, right. yeah. So yeah. so yeah, as long as I can run a, 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 a kernel cycle with this other substance, but then it's becoming, a, it's an assumption that has similar content to the one that Poincaré is pointing Absolutely. And, 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 right, yeah. Uh, so, well, if, if, you, if you look at, at Locke's book on, on thermodynamics, he proves this result, um, but only for fluids. Uh, so it's not necessarily an ideal gas, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a system whose state space is two-dimensional. Uh, and uh, and then he just infers by just relation that it must be all for all other systems in, in the UK, in the world. Uh, yeah. So why did we need the assumption that the adiabatic curves form a foliation of their state space? Uh, what do you need that that for? Um, Basically, uh, because uh, uh, you know, if I'm going to approximate my curve um, as uh, um, as a sequence of adiabats and, um, and 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 isotherms, I have to have an adiabat available to me at any place. Why were you trying to draw that diagram in the first place? Because um, what I wanted to argue is that this is going to be true for any QSR cycle because it's true for current cycles. I, I, I think this is all, in a, in a certain sense, I'm, I'm worrying and expecting, this goes back to John's observation, that there are definitely some assumptions in theory about what you can do to supplement what you can't do. And this is something that I really like. Effectively, it's going to be that there, there needs to be some system such that whatever its current state and its current temperature, you can move it to any other temperature you like in it by by a yeah. So the idea of gas identifies right. that principle, right. but um, we're, we're worrying that it requires something specific to identify the gases. Aren't they? Do we want some very general calculation of how this would be? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. There, there, there is. You can start with any point. The real something is you can start from any point on any isotherm and go from an idea of that 
by by an ID band to any to another isotherm at any other temperature. That's that's really the assumption. Yeah. Just to see if I'm following. Uh, so the contrary the assumption that then you can use that then adiabatic curves from foliation uh, equals uh, the claim that there's a state state function that's going to be the entropy. And so but you can't just assume in your proof there that there is an adiabatic curve at every point. Is that is that what's going on? So you were trying to I guess prove that claim there. That that's the that integral is so so, yeah. So yeah, I mean so it sounds like all you know all I need to define entropy is the is the assumption that um, when there is yeah. the the, the, the uh, diabats fill the, the state space because yeah. the the diabats um, that you know from that alone yeah. there's, a, there's there's a state function that is constant along the diabats adiabats whatever but this doesn't follow that you know, to go from one ADU bat to another. This is going to be this is going to be true, no matter what path I go from one ADU bat to another. Function yeah. constant on the ADU bats. What's that? The function constant on the ADU bats. Right. If you go from one to the other, the change in that function is simply a function of starting ADU bat and the ending ADU bat. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does, but it doesn't follow that it's the integral of dQ over t. Right. Okay. And that's that's important for for this to be entropy. You know, like not just every function that's constant along, along the adiabats is, is is entropy. The function that's you know yeah. given the, the, this this is you know the, this is the difference between these values on two adiabats is given by the integral from one to another by dq over t, and that requires um, that to be the same no matter what path I take from one adiabat to another. Uh, you're, you're looking more I would else. say, uh, I'm not quite sure if this is different from what you were saying. Uh, as long as it, that function is constant on adiabats, right. uh, then the entropy difference, or uh, the difference of that function, if you move from one adiabat to another, is going to depend only on the initial and final adiabat. Right. Uh, so it's going to depend only on, on the initial entropy. Right. So yeah. So whether that particular function is of uh, is just the difference of the end and the final. Okay. That's, yeah. that's a conventional choice. Right. But it's it's going to be independent right. of the choice of path for any function that's constant. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, here's what I'm saying. If I just tell you about state space of something, and there's some foli foliation of that state space, then yeah, there, then then there is a state function that's going to be constant along members of those foliations. I tell you something more. If I say, moreover, it's a property of that foliation that if you if I take if I go from one to another along any reversible path, then the integral of dq over t is going to be this, the same on any one of those reversible paths. I mean, that's the, the, that, um, the, the first thing I said tells you almost nothing about the state space. The, the second thing I said requires, I, you know, I know what temperature means, it requires I, I, I know what the difference between heat, I, I know what, a, what, what changes are, changes which are heat transfer and so and, and um, so yeah I mean and this part is really important that this particular not the, the, the you know this thing here dq over t is this is is the same no matter what what reversible path I take from one space to one space to another I mean, that's that's what's important about this function being played from a that role that it does yeah, but it's, it's more or less a scaling right. convention of the entropy function. Okay. Right. Right. Well, just just like for. I mean, it's just. I mean, 
If I just say that the area bats foliate the state space, I haven't yet told you that the integral from any two points in states between any two spaces, the points in state space of dq over t, is going to be the same on any reversible path. So, I mean, really, the important thing is not just you have to be it's just some function on state space that's uh, that's um, constant. It, 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 Moreover, difference between two entropies is going to be given that, and that is going to be independent of the path that I that I take. That's that's really that's the substantive part. I think. Yeah. Um, just check how to be sort of thinking about some of this stuff. Um, are we sort of assume, so are we assuming that uh, we've been given the state space of our thermodynamic system, whatever that system may be, in the mm -hmm. way that we, you know, so we have a state space for the ideal gas mm -hmm. of like PVT, um, or well, I suppose PMV by themselves. Um, are we assuming that, you know, whatever system we might be given, someone also says, by the way, the state space is uniquely characterized in this way, and then we're discovering what things are functions of state to whatever, or is it more in the nature of Kind of building the state space, like finding some functions that uh, will uniquely characterize the state that can be treated as uniquely characterized. Yes. Yeah. Systems. Yeah. Let me say something more about these state spaces of thermodynamic systems. So, for the ideal gas, um, you know, you can characterize the thermodynamic state of something by specifying pressure, volume, and temperature. Um, but because they're related by the uh, equation of state, the ideal gas law, if you specify two of them you've specified the third also. So the ideal gas has a two-dimensional state space. And we're assuming for other um, systems, there's a you know, finite number of parameters that we can use to characterize the, um, the thermodynamic state. Um, and you know, so for things like ferromagnets, it's going to be um, the magnetization and external magnetic field. We can treat those as um, thermodynamic systems also. Um, and those are going to be related to the, temp to the, the, uh, the temperature by a, a um, equation of state. Um, yeah, so we're assuming I have a thermodynamic system um, whose state space is characterized by a certain um, a number of parameters. I'm assuming that I know of my thermodynamic system, I know the, the difference between doing work on an on it and heating it. Um, so with the gas um, compressing the, 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 the you know, piston counts I'm doing as, as, as doing work or putting it in contact with a, a reservoir at different temperature counts is transferring um, you know, heat or actually putting it into a into a con contact with something and expanding it or contracting it counts as um, transferring heat. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, that, that's what I'm assuming. And um, the argument here is that since this is true for an ideal gas, it's, it, and I, it, it, it's going to be true for any thermodynamic system I can use as the work, working substance of the heat engine between those two reservoirs. And if that's the case, then for that other system too, I can define you know, this entropy function, which um, will be um, a state function. Moreover, a state function such that the difference between the, the function between two states is given by and it'll be such that this is the same for any reversible path between two states. And so I can define a state function um, uh, such that the, the, uh, the difference between two states is given by that integral between them uh, on any reversible path. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, so that is you know, the quantity we call thermodynamic entropy. Um, and also we're writing it in um, differential form that you know, small change is equal to dq over t on, on 
um, for a small um, QSR change. Um, so I want to point out is that, that we said at the beginning that we need to know the difference between um, heat heat transfer and doing work in order to um, in order to state the second law in um, either the Kelvin or the Clausius um, formulation. We need to know the difference between heat transfer and doing work in order to define this function because it's got this EQ in the definition. Um, and so in order to define the entropy, we, you know, we need to know the difference between heat and uh, heating something and doing work on it. Okay. So for a reversible process, um, the um, the integral of dq over t around the cycle is going to be um, it is uh, going to be zero. Um, if I, a non-reversible process, which is you know not as you know, a reversible process is one that is you know where um, you're essentially operating a heat engine as efficiently as it can be between two reservoirs. So you know we can also imagine um, a non-reversible heat engine operating between those two reservoirs. And that will have a lower efficiency. And because you know, so if I have two two reservoirs and a heat engine operating between them, it has a lower e efficiency. Then um, I'm going to get less work out for a certain amount of Q in. And um, that means that um, Q in over um, uh, um, over the uh, the, the, the Q in over over um, T H uh, minus Q out over T H is, is 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 going to be negative. So for a reversible process, this thing is equal to zero. For a non-reversible process, it's going to be less than zero. And. Um, Another way of saying that is, is that you know, for any small change, um, um, this is going to dq over t is going to be less than or equal to what it would be for a um, for a reversible process, and ds is what it would be for a reversible process. And, and you know, another way of saying that is, you know, ds is greater than or equal to dq over t. And that means that if I have an adiabatic process, if it's reversible, ds is equal to zero. I mean, that's what Yos was saying, that on an adiabat entropy is constant for, um, for uh, um, if you go from one point to, uh, to another by, by a, 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 a reversible process on, on a, a, um, a um, that. And um, so if dq equals zero, then for any process, reversible or not, the change, the change in entropy is going to be greater than equal to zero. Which gives us a, another statement of the second law is that for an isolated system, the entropy does not decrease. Yeah. I was wondering, you don't mention uh, the term quasi static in this particular set of statements. Yeah. Um, that I think I think what I'm doing is I'm just using reversible as shorthand for QSR. Yes, but uh, you distinguish between reversible processes, which yeah, yeah. in your case is, is right. synonymous to QSR, uh, but then the other processes. Right. Where you just are they still quasi static but not reversible, or are they any arbitrary irreversible process that need not even be quasi static? I guess to even associate points on the um, state diagram with stages of the process. 
Yeah, so, so to, re to, uh, to regard the process as a process that goes through a path through, through, the, through the, the, the state space, I have to be able to uh, associate values of these thermodynamic process parameters which, with, with, with every moment, which means I have to treat the system as in equilibrium in all cases. So, um, yeah, so pro any process I can regard as, as, as um, represented as a path through the state space has to be quite stuck because I have to you know, treat it as, as if it's equal in any point of time. And I guess if it's not quasi static, you, 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 it would be like, here's the, here, here, here's the beginning point, here's the final point, but I can't treat it, I, I can't represent it as a path through the state space. Yeah, and, and yeah. Yeah. they're going to matter a lot. Right. Yeah. For example, you yeah. have a balloon and a vacuum yeah. and you pop it. Right. That's, 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 an, that's an example yeah. where you've got the, right. the beginning point, the end point, right. but yeah. it doesn't there's no go path. through. Yeah, there's no path through a sequence of, e of, of effective equilibrium states from one to the other. Yeah. Okay. What's that? that but, uh, this, this is not a criticism. No. No, no, that's, a, no that's an important point for clarification, yes. Yeah, no, what, what you're pointing at is, is that the, the state space representation is very incomplete. There's a hell of a lot of other machinery that you've just got to know about or you, or you can't function. Yeah, yeah. And, and another thing is that uh, in this formulation uh, the, for the cycle, the T uh, is basically the temperature of the heat reservoir. Uh, now, it's only when it's quasi static. Mm -hmm that we can assume that mm -hmm. the thermal contact right. the heat mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. so it's temperature, the system has the mm -hmm. same temperature mm -hmm. as the heat part. If it's not quasi-static, if it's very fast and, and out of equilibrium, we don't know what, is, what the temperature of the system is. Yeah, it doesn't even make sense. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And then the T mm -hmm. in that formula doesn't refer to the system. Right, it refers to the temperature of the of the heat reservoir. That is, yeah. Right. Yes. In which, yeah. Right. With which it is not in equilibrium. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. But but all of it, it all works out because you've got a process that has an equilibrium state at the beginning, an equilibrium state at the end. You don't know how the hell you got from one place to another, but because they're equilibrium states, you can still define their entropy. Mm -hmm. And the second law is then saying, you know, if it's a closed system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm -hmm. That will, that change will be non-decreasing. You got that right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do I see? Maybe you're talking about this in the next slide. Uh, uh, the relationship between that way of stating the second law and the uh, clauses and Kelvin's formulations. How do I? What is the connection between those? Um. All right. So. Um, We actually, yeah, we actually started with the with with, with the Clausius formulation to um, come to the conclusion that, that um, any two reversible engines operating um, between two different reservoirs will have the same efficiency, and any other engine is going to have a, a lower efficiency, and that was required in order to, um, you know. You know and, and I and I used that to argue that, that you know, the, for the existence of this state function. And in fact, I mean, this 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 is a way of yeah. This is essentially the um, given that dq over t is um, around the cycle is zero for a Carnot cycle, and a Carnot cycle is a reversible cycle. Then for any cycle using those two um, heat, heat engines. DQ over T is going to be zero or less, depending on whether the engine has the same efficiency or lower efficiency. So that follows pretty straightforwardly from the closest version of the, of the second law um, plus consideration of the Carnot cycle um, as, as a possible cycle sum system to do. And, um, and um, Where's that? Yeah, yeah, you get back and nothing flat, right? So yeah, this so this is that there is pretty much 
uh, found straightforwardly equivalent to the Clausius statement second law. And uh, the equivalence of the Kelvin statement um, um, yeah, I mean, if I could um, derive um, a mechanical effect from, from something by extracting heat uh, um, from something and not dumping any heat into something cooler, then I'd have a, a, an engine um, uh, that um, I'd have an engine more efficient than the, um, the, 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 the car car that one. There's another adjustment. What you are and how you can change that. Sure. This is an assumption you can turn word into how you get like it. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Background assumptions that David Walsh just mentioned that you know that you can you know there's certain things you can do. Then you know in, in the presence of those background assumptions, they're equivalent in the sense that you can start from with one and derive the other, and vice versa. Or, you know, they fall from each other. Logically equivalent. Logically equivalent. Um, why below some background assumptions that people often take for granted and don't explicitly say. Yeah, yeah to, to, to uh, expand a little bit on that, there's a, uh, there's a discussion, not so well known, I'm afraid, but uh, very interesting at least, I hope, is that uh, one of these background assumptions is that the absolute temperatures are uh, positive. Uh, and that, uh, but there are thermodynamic, exotic thermodynamic systems uh, whose absolute temperatures are negative, uh, or at least you could play with those, uh, even as a thought example. Uh, but there are also real physical systems that uh, can be characterized in a useful way with a negative absolute temperature. Uh, and the question comes up whether the Clausius and the Kelvin statement are still equivalent for those, or and if they're not, which of the two is violated? And I know two discussions of those, this issue. One from the 1920s by uh, Tatjana Ehrenfest, who argues that Kelvin's statement is still true, but Clausius' statement is false. And then there is another discussion from 1957 by Ramsey, uh, Nobel laureate. Um, who claims that in this case uh, Clausius' statement is still true, but Kelvin's statement is wrong. Well, oh, that's interesting. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the point is that, of course, in both of these cases, there is a implicit use of terms like hot mm -hmm. and cooling, mm -hmm. and um, there are various ways in which you can define those in, in uh, these unusual concepts. But, because actually, uh, in this case, I mean, if, if you have absolute temperatures lo uh, less than zero, uh, you can decrease temperature uh, by putting en energy into your system. Uh, now, would you call that cooling? Or would you call that heating? Usually, if we put energy into a system, we think of it as heating. But now we're bringing the temperature down as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gets more, it gets colder, right? Um, yeah. And so you can, you can make different choices of, of your conventions uh, in order to decide which of the two uh, you keep and which of the two one are violated. Yeah, I take it these systems are all dangerously unstable. Uh, there are, 
it depends a little there they are unstable but there's another question about whether therm the laws of thermodynamics should only hold for stable oh no no I'm, I'm just I'm just making a remark I'm sort of imagining we have one of these things sitting here on the table it sucks the heat into it, it gets colder, so it sucks yeah. more and more and more. Not necessarily. I mean, <laughs> the I mean, what, actually, actually, the example. Well, no, those are the examples. The, the yeah. examples that Ramsey come and come to are these uh, uh, spin systems with inverted populations. Lasers are in. And they're, they're in every laser. Um, so your CD player has, at its heart, a system with negative absolute temperature. Yeah. But it just did suck up the rest of your. Okay, <laughs> is it, well, what, well, why not? Um, is it self-limiting in some way? I, I mean... I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's in thermal contact with the brew, right? Yes. By the way, it won't be long before no one knows what a CD player is. <laughs> <laughs> John, I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can give the answer in aspect of thermodynamics, but just in terms of the stat make, a finite amount of energy will cool it cool it to minus infinity, then it goes minus infinity and plus infinity when it divides, and then it comes back down. Oh, so right. it stabilizes itself. Yeah, I call that self limiting that. Yeah, in, in a sense, these, these temperatures which are below absolute zero are in, in an intuitive sense even hotter mm -hmm. than infinity. So, so, they, so they run away, the heat capacities uh, don't stay finite, the heat capacities have yeah. got, got to be dropping down to zero, otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't get to minus infinity with a finite amount of energy going in. Other discussion of this? You're just absolutely right. Going from here to here, I assume that T is positive. No, in, in the equivalence between yeah, the company right. and the cloud. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think I'm almost focused. Um, you know, if you work out an ideal gas, you can, you know, it, it, it's easy to, relatively easy to um, explicitly calculate the um, entropy difference of states in terms of the um, volume and um, temperature, if you want the details, they're in the notes, I just quote it there. Um, and yeah. then I'm done. Um, but, you know, the third law, as far as I know, doesn't figure prominently into discussions of foundations of thermodynamics and, and, and system mechanics, but you know, since I said I was going to talk about the, the um, laws of thermodynamics, um, um, I'll get into this. Um, one way of um, expressing it is no finite sequence of cyber process can see in cooling your body down to absolute zero. So if I had you know some kind of um, you know engine that I'm trying to use to extract heat from something, cool it down until you know the engine works in a cyber manner, you know cool it down and cool it down. There's going to be diminishing returns. I'm going to get less and less temperature drop. Um, and, uh, uh, um, Per cycle, and I'll never get the you get the system I'm trying to cool down back up to zero. And another statement of it that is um, often said to be equivalent, and I must confess I haven't thought too much about what background assumptions go into the equivalence of those, is that, um, entropy of every pure crystalline substance approaches the same value as the temperature approaches um, to zero. I mention that because um, what this does is it gives us a you know um, you know the previous slide we just you know had um, entropy defined up to an arbitrary at the constant because because all we got was entropy difference between two states um, but that statement of the third law gives us a natural zero point for entropy because you can say hey that. You know, entropy value that every pure crystal substance approaches as temperature approaches zero is called that the zero point of entropy. Did, did you really find a statement that mentioned crystalline? Um, yes, and I, I, I did. And I think the reason for that is, um, I'm not absolutely certain, but yeah, um, I, I, um, a, a number of places I found this out. Hmm. Um, I think the reason for that is that um, 
not a pure crystalline sub substance, like if it's got you know, impurities in it, then you can have them in a more or less random position. Or, no. I, I honestly don't, I haven't thought about it. I, 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 don't, I don't know why that's in here, but uh, yeah, I was fine. Well, you know, yeah. Several places I found that, yeah. If I stand next to you, you can say it's not crystalline, it'll be turned to a degree of different microstates and hash with the, the same microstates and stuff like this, coming around in different ways. Yeah. So it's going to have to be differences. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think that that's, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the reasons why it's never got so prominent is also because it's, uh, uh, well, there are these various different formulations mm -hmm. of the law, mm -hmm. and it never got Quite a pro um, to be quite as important as, as the other laws, particularly because uh, these other laws are, are supposed to hold for all thermodynamic systems. Mm -hmm. They never mention any particular type of substance. Right, and the interesting it's, thing is, you know, this you know this one is general. Doesn't mention particular kinds of things, whereas that one yeah. talks about pure crystalline and, substances. And yeah. Many people understand this third law as being quantum effect. Yeah, that's, that's right. what I was so going to say. It's, it's, it's due to the fact that according to quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. the specific heat of all substances should mm -hmm. tend to zero, mm -hmm. at absolute zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was Nernst's heat statement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Nernst wanted to give it a higher status by calling it the third law mm -hmm. of dynamics. Uh, but since for example, the ideal gas mm -hmm. is a bona fide, maybe non-existent, but mm -hmm. bona fide thermodynamical system, mm -hmm. in the same way as, as a body moving freely through empty space mm -hmm. does not exist mm -hmm. in the real world, but is mm -hmm. the thought example of classical mechanics. Uh, and the third law doesn't hold for that. Right, because the, the, the heat capacity of, a, of an ideal gas is independent of temperature, whereas the third law, that first one says, you know, heat capacity yeah. goes, you know, yeah. Yeah, um, goes to zero when it's not the See, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. That's, yeah. So actually, um, the existence of things approximating at ideal gases at, at down to arbitrary low temperatures is inconsistent with the third law. Way. And what happens to real gases, of course, if you cool them, you know, at fixed pressure, you cool them down enough, they, they, they look by and they don't even, you know, yeah. act like gases at all. And another way of putting it is that the, in terms of the, the specific, right. specificity of the third law, I guess, is that yeah. the, the framework you've given us so far is, I think, compatible with basically pretty arbitrary smooth right. state functions of the system. Mm -hmm. Right. That is the function of energy volume, say. Right. Yeah. Is now state functions, right? Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah. 